Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Beach Side Podcast. I'm your host, the HOD of the BSP. Like, share, comment on the YouTube version, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Enable notifications to receive all the updates from these episodes and all the content on the channel. Follow us on social media and listen on any podcast listening platform. I think it's only appropriate that we should start the episode and open it from Spain and from La Liga. And we're going to focus, of course, on El Clasico, without a doubt. Uh, No spoilers here. It was pretty uneventful round 29 in La Liga, aside from El Clasico, really. It started on Friday with Athletic Club drawing against uh, Tafe, won all Deportivo Alaves, losing at home to Granada on Saturday uh, afternoon kickoff. Elche losing against Valencia at home 1 0, Osasuna defeating Levante 3 1. Atletico grinding out a classic 1 0 win away from home against Rayo Vallecano. Espanyol on Sunday defeating Mallorca 1 0, Cadiz the same scoreline defeating Villarreal as well, in a pretty, let's say, Shocking result in a way. Uh, Celta Vigo 0-0 against Real Betis and Sevilla against Real Sociedad drawing 0-0 as well. Uh, and then, of course, it was the big main event. It was El Clasico at the Santiago Bernabeu, Real Madrid versus Barcelona. A game where everybody thought, you know what, this is the big test for Barcelona. Everybody said that they improved under Xavi Hernandez, and this was a real test. This was the real kicker. Barcelona and the Barcelona fans, I suppose, were waiting for, for this Clasico to see the real extent of the improvement. And to be fair, it was absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, it was maybe mostly down to how bad Real Madrid were, how bad Carlo Ancelotti managed the game. Um, without Benzema and Mendy, I mean... The result would have been excusable or, in a way, justifiable if, for example, Real Madrid lost 1-0 or 2-1. We could, they could even say, oh, we didn't have Benzema, uh, so it really makes a difference if uh, in the scoreline. But when you lose 4-0, and when your defence and midfield are that bad, I mean, you can't really excuse it that much. Um, the start of the game was pretty intense, pretty frantic. There was no real introductions or trying to feel in, uh, a feeling out process from, from both sides. Boston ended intense, sharp, focused. They were pressing Real Madrid high. They are almost pressing them in their six-yard box. Real Madrid, I don't know, I felt like they willingly invited Barcelona to play. They, f- they willingly invited Barcelona to attack them and really push forward with numbers. Um, you know, they played a, a sort of a 4-1, 4-1 kind of thing with Cruz and Modric higher up the pitch than usual, with Casemiro right in behind them. Federico Valverde was uh, a right winger of sorts. Rodrigo was a centre forward, which would never go into work anyway. And it didn't work really to the surprise of absolutely no one. Um, you know, it, it looked like only v- they were trying to lean towards Vinicius too much, uh, who has been really, let's say, well marked. I mean, we have to give the credits to Ronald Araujo on the right hand side of, of Barcelona, who really was a good a choice to start as a right back, considering that Des was injured and Danny Alves is 38 years old, which is impossible to match the pace of Vinicius at that age, even with all the experience that he has. So, um, Barcelona really bossed the game. There's no two, uh, two ways about it. They really dominated the game. There was a period in the first half, for the first 5 to 10 minutes, or the first 15 minutes, really, where Real Madrid had a couple of good ach- good chances, good counters, really, one for um, one for Rodrigo, one for uh, Valverde from a, from a sprint and, and a run from Vinicius, which is probably about the only real run where Vinicius had had the opportunity to like dribble as he wants to and cut back and cut inside as he wants to and then after that Barcelona dominated the game there's no there's no real doubt that Barcelona were the better side the midfield in particular was immense Pedri was an absolute boss in this game um, you know it was basically rolling down the years rolling back the years for Barcelona to the tick attack out of the Guardiola days in 2009 Busquets was absolutely brilliant Pedri was tremendous in terms of, uh, of, of controlling the ball and and really I mean doing what what Modric does at Real Madrid really what Cruz does at Real Madrid and uh, Real Madrid's midfield was so bad that the first substitution that they did in the second half was a second half substitution like was in half substitution Cruz for Camavinga I mean Carlo Ancelotti really didn't have a lot of options to, to choose from uh, and, and we didn't de- didn't even talk about the goals we didn't even talk about the goals like that was I mean Real Madrid were really really awful 
last night. It was really tremendously uh, ridiculous performance from from uh, Real Madrid. You know, the goals were... I mean, every goal is a masterpiece of defensive mistakes from Real Madrid. The first two goals, you know, or the first goal, a mistaken marking uh, uh, from Alaba and Militao. The second goal is the same thing. And on a set piece, which is doubly bad, how a corner is played like that. No, but basically nobody jumped uh, alongside uh, Araujo and Militao did. And he couldn't be, and he couldn't beat Araujo in the header. David Alaba in the first goal probably should have jumped into the header uh, first and and take it out for a corner maybe who's worried about their own goal but eventually Bamyang just snatched it in front of him the third goal in the second half um, you know also a calamity of mistakes a giveaway from Alaba uh, you know not exactly the best recovery from Real Madrid in the midfield and again that formation of 4-1-4-1 pushed the Real Madrid midfield so high that the spaces were absolutely vast behind them any long ball, any short ball, any real pinged pass from the likes of De Jong, Pedri or Busquets in the midfield will find Aubameyang up front, who was immense as well, who really proved his worth for the Barcelona fans in this Clásico scoring a brace, of course, including a fourth goal that also was an, another uh, calamity of mistakes, of course, despite the tight call about the offside in the end. It was a goal. It was given a goal after VAR intervention. It was also a bad mistake from from Real Madrid, leaving so much space for Barcelona to run in behind. And of course, after the fourth goal, basically the game lost its meaning, and nobody really cared um, how this game will end. Nobody even even cared if Barcelona would you know score too much or uh, two more goals or three more goals uh, and add them to those four goals. So it really the game ended there and then. Um, Barcelona left, basically left the ball to Real Madrid, they tried, um, you know, Ancelotti brought in Mariano Diaz, Vasquez, Asensio, he tried almost everything in the book to salvage a sort of, I don't know, um, I'm not going to say honourable result because when you lose 4-0 with that kind of performance, there's nothing honourable, um, but really he tried to make it sound a little bit appealing, scoring a couple of goals maybe. I mean, to be fair, I can't really understand if Real Madrid were better or is it because Barcelona just left them the ball. I think it may be mostly because of the second one. Barcelona left them the ball to play, try and score, but without any real uh, danger. There's no, There was no real chances that Ter Stegen, for example, had to really push himself to the limit and, and save. Um, Barcelona were really good. They were intense, focused, sharp. I liked how Xavi was always angry and always, um, you know, um, sharp and focused and, and, and you know, uh, very agitated and animated on the, on the touchline, even on a 4-0 lead. Uh, he was really pushing his players to press, pushing his players to uh, still a fight for every ball, uh, every duel, for every aerial, uh, you know, battle. It was really big, big game as far as Barcelona is concerned. I really couldn't pick a man of the match for this game. All of the players in Barcelona were immense. Um, everyone did his job. Barcelona really could have scored um, like maybe eight or nine goals legitimately. Thibaut Courtois was again immense for Real Madrid once more, even as bad of a performance as um, even as bad of a performance as Real Madrid did. Courtois still was the man of the match for Real Madrid. Still was the man who saved him from like four or five goals at the very least, uh, either side of half time. Overall, it's a deserved victory for Barcelona. It's definitely a big, big proving ground for this Barcelona under Xavi Hernandez from the, the, from how far they came from the ways they were like 200 days ago, uh, when they were eliminated from the Champions League and were thinking about how the season is going to go for them and people were fantasizing about the, the worst of scenarios. I think now we could say that Barcelona, not truly back, but I think on the real way to being back. Uh, to proper Barcelona style and to real Barcelona value in European football. So overall, um, again, it was a pretty uneventful week in La Liga. The table stands like this. Real Madrid with 66 points now. It is Now it is 9 points behind uh, or ahead of Sevilla. 54 for Barcelona at 3rd, as well as Atletico at 454. 54 Betis. Real Sociedad for 48. 45 for Real. 
41 for Athletic Bilbao, 40 for Valencia, 38 for Osasuna, 36 for Celta, 36 for Espanyol, 32 for Rava Vallecano, 32 for Elche, 29 for Hetafe, 29 for, uh, 28 for Granada, Cadiz, 27, and the three at the bottom, Mallorca, Alaves and Levente with 19 points at the bottom of La Liga table. Turning the attention to England now, and not to the Premier League, we'll, we'll give that a little bit later. We'll start with the FA Cup uh, in the of, on the weekend, of course. It was the quarterfinal taking place of that competition, and it resulted in the most predictable, let's say, semi-final we could have. Of course, a big semi-final, by the way. The draw was made also. It will be Manchester City versus Liverpool in that semi-final in Wembley, and it will be Crystal Palace facing Chelsea. Those results came by as Chelsea defeated Middlesbrough 2-0 on uh, Saturday. It was a pretty a pretty ba basic uh, game for Chelsea. They dominated. They were the better side. Lukaku scored, which is a good momentum booster for him. Hakim Ziyech added the second goal in the 31st minute of that game, and it was 2-0 for Chelsea. Another good momentum boosting victory before, of course, the Champions League game against Real Madrid and before the rest of the season in England. Crystal Palace dumped another more dirt on Everton, beating them 4-0 in the quarterfinal at the Sellers Park. Mark Gehi made it 1-0, Mateta made it 2-0, Wilfried Zaha added the third, and Will Hughes made it four to round up the victory for Crystal Palace at the Sellers Park. Patrick Vieira's side is doing really well this season, and getting to the semi-final of the FA Cup is even more, uh, is even an, another achievement uh, added to his, um, to his this season. Manchester City um, struggled a little bit against Southampton, to be fair, for about an hour or so, uh, but they managed to beat them 4-1 away from home at the St. Mary's. Raheem Sterling opened the scoring inside 12th minute. Laporta, with an unfortunate own goal, made it one all for, for Southampton. Of course, it was a bit nervous at that time, as well as the start of the second half, but Kevin De Bruyne's penalty in the 62nd minute, I, although I thought a little bit, it was a little bit of a soft penalty given, really, for City, but De Bruyne converted anyway. Phil Foden made it three, and Morris, after an unbelievable team goal, made it 4-1 for City, and they go now to meet Liverpool in the semi-final, so they will meet them twice in April, uh, as far as City are concerned. They meet them in the league and in the cup. Uh, Nottingham Forest uh, played or hosted Liverpool, and Liverpool ran away winners by one goal to nil, and the goal came from Diogo Jota in the 78th minute. It was a one-sided game, as you'd expect. Nottingham didn't put much of a fight, and Liverpool go through to the semi-final. As you mentioned, it's going to be a big semi-final. City versus Liverpool is going to be anticipated, considering that the schedule now for City is just getting harder. They have Atletico, Liverpool, and then Atletico again, and then you have uh, Liverpool in the cup as well in mid-April. To the Premier League, and despite Chelsea, Liverpool and City not being featured this weekend, it was a pretty exciting, I should say, week for the Premier League. It started on Friday with Wolverhampton hosting Leeds in an unbelievable game. A big comeback for Leeds United under Jesse Marsh, who'd really started to show signs of progress. Uh, they're now seven points ahead of Watford in the closest relegation spot. They played all of their games. It was an unbelievable victory for them against Wolves away from home. Wolves were leading 2 nil and half time but in the second half it was leads with the comeback jack harrison rodrigo moreno and then luke eiling with a 91st minute goal to make it 3-2 for leeds the problem still persists defensively they're still the worst defense in the premier league but probably they will take it now as they keep getting victories and keep getting points in the season aston villa um on saturday the one match that was played on saturday lost to arsenal 1-0 again just like boston in spain Arsenal and England are really showing signs of improvement as well. They're really leading that chase for the top four spots, taking advantage of the fact that United didn't play uh, as well. And they even get themselves closer to Chelsea with five points behind them. Um, you know, they were the better side for the most part. Aston Villa didn't really put a lot of resistance in the first half. In the second half, um, they tried, they made some substitutions, but Steven Gerrard's side 
couldn't win the game, couldn't get any points from this game because Saka's only goal in the 30th minute made the difference for Arsenal. On Saturday, it was Leicester City uh, defeating Brentford 2-1. to They really needed that victory, Leicester, uh, to pick up some form in the Premier League after a little bit of a wobbly feat, being uh, losing in the Conference League, albeit still qualifying and still uh, going through but after the loss against Arsenal in the Premier League it was I think a big important task for Leicester City to get the victory back and it was against Brentford a side that really seems to not know exactly where they are going the fact is the, the, the two victories that they picked up against Burnley and against Norwich probably would be the ones maybe saving them from relegation I suppose um, they really may be in danger of, of dropping down a little bit not the relegation point but I think uh, they need they want to finish the season in the best way they can I'm sure of that but for Leicester it's big it's an important victory in a season where they couldn't really uh, put themselves in the in the place in the table that they like uh, they will really take any points and they will try to finish the season with as best of form as they can and then of course Tottenham in a big battle top four uh, related they defeated West Ham three Three to one. Um, this was one of the best games, the one of the better games certainly for Spurs uh, this season. I mean, it's really inconsistent for for Spurs. They're the kings of inconsistency. It seems they uh, they, they they win some, they lose some. And this is the first time they do back-to-back victories against uh, any sides in the Premier League. Like for 17 games under Conte, they've been winning and losing, winning and losing. Um, you know, at the moment, for the last 17 games, sorry, under Conte, they've been winning and losing in every competition. They now finally won a couple of games back to back, which is a real uh, big uh, improvement point, I would say, for Spurs. Um, they they put on one of the best performances. They mentioned Kane scored, Son scored. It was really, um, really big improvement as far as, um, you know, as Tottenham is concerned. Sorry, Kane didn't score, Kurt Zuma scored. Hyunmin Son added the th- second and the third goal for uh, Spurs. It was a brilliant performance from him individually against Said Barama's only goal for West Ham United. Thus, putting the Premier League table like this, City, of course, still with 70 points at the top, 69 for Liverpool, 55, 59 for Chelsea with uh, two games in hand, Arsenal two games in hand, 54, Spurs 51 with one game in hand at 5th United with one game in hand 50 48 points for West Ham uh, 46 for Wolverhampton 36 for Villa with one game in hand 36 for Leicester with three games in hand 35 for Southampton with one game in hand Brighton uh, 34 for Crystal Palace 33 for Brighton uh, 31 for Newcastle all with one game in hand Burnford with 30 points leads 29 25 for Everton 22 for Watford Burnley uh, with 21 and Le- Norwich City with 17 points at the bottom of the table. The rest of the fixture is going to be played as this. Liverpool versus Man United is going to be on the 19th of April. On the 20th of April, Newcastle versus Crystal Palace, City versus Hove, Brighton, Hove Albion, and Burley Southampton is going to be on the 21st of April. To the Bundesliga now, and action started in round 27 in a, let's say, more than dis- in a disappointing way, to be fair. In a VFL Bochum versus Borussia Mönchengladbach game on Friday, game was postponed um, after the uh, some seriously bad events happening in that game. The assistant referee was attacked by the Bochum fans in the stadium. The game was uh, interrupted at the beginning, and then uh, it decided that it would be suspended and postponed to another date. Uh, of course, the, the the score was 2-0 for Borussia Mönchengladbach, so maybe you potentially understand why that happened. Obviously, no justification whatsoever to violence against referees or against any uh, relation uh, to football. On Saturday, things ticked off with Mainz beating Armenia Bellefeld 4-0, another incredible performance from Bose Venson's, uh, from Bose Venson's side. They were really uh, immense in that game against the Armenia Bielefeld side who are really all but maybe considering relegation at this point they're really really in the mud at the moment this is their 12th loss this season and they didn't seem to be picking up form anytime soon this is the fourth loss in a row for Armenia Bielefeld um, and it's and it came against sides you know in general you know b- probably um, that are, you expect them to, to lose against. Mainz are a good team. Dortmund are a good team. Bayer Leverkusen as well. Um, although the last victory was against Union Berlin, so there's that as well. But definitely, it's another big, important victory for Mainz. 37 point they go now up to 10th. Hertha Berlin defeated Hoffenheim 3-0. A shocking result, I suppose, because Hoffenheim 
or really trying to fight for those uh, top four spots as well uh, as, as Freiburg and Leipzig. They really um, were on a good form heading into this game. They just drawn against Bayern uh, the last time out. They were on a four uh, victory series or four win streak uh, heading into this game. Out of the game before Bayern uh, dropped it with a draw. Uh, and then, of course, the loss against Hertha Berlin. Again, a surprising result considering that Hertha are literally in the relegation spot and the playoff spot. Uh, at 16th, um, Grutterford drawn against Freiburg 0-0, that dents a little bit of a dent in the armour to Freiburg's hopes of getting the top four, although they're still pretty close, they're still on joint on points with Leipzig with 45 points as well, Stuttgart defeated Augsburg 3-2, an unbelievable uh, game really in the Mercedes-Benz arena, Stuttgart are trying to fight every which way they can to avoid slipping and dropping into the relegation spots really and they defeated a direct opponent in that in Augsburg as well and Bayern München defeated Union Berlin on Saturday afternoon 4-0 it was a no surprise uh, that Bayern won 4-0 really against Union Berlin Lewandowski with a brace Nianzu with a second goal and Kuman with one goal this is a game where Bayern were finally back to the 4-2-3-1 in a way. Um, they played Josip Stanisic on the right, Hernandez on the left, Gimish and Musiala in the centre midfield. It was more like Bayern this game, I think, and particularly with the games coming ahead uh, for for Bayern. For Bayern, there's um, surely there's De Classique coming in the big distance. Of course, you think about a game against Freiburg next, um, you know, the next round after the international break ends. Villarreal versus Bayern Munich in the Champions League is the imminent future. It's going to be a real big, big. Uh, game as well, despite the fact that the, the, the draw may look easy, but I think the game is going to be hard anyway. For Bayern Munich, this is a better performance and one of the performances that they should really build upon for the rest of the season, considering that the bad period that they had as of late. On Sunday, it was Leipzig drawn against Frankfurt 0-0, a game that didn't help Leipzig scores, trying to get into that third position, maybe try to secure themselves as far as the top four battle and the Champions League spots is concerned. And Bayer Leverkusen um, added more misery to Wolfsburg, who really, I mean, feel safer a little bit now. Five points ahead of, of Hertha Berlin in the relegation zone, but still a loss is a loss. Leverkusen, after dropping or going out in the Europa League against Atalanta, they really came back strong, albeit it took them a little bit late to win this game against Wolfsburg. Two goals come from Paulinho in the 86th minute and in the 92nd minute for Bayer Leverkusen. And Köln held Borussia Dortmund to a one all draw. Yanis Majesh Wolf made it 1 0 for uh, for Borussia Dortmund before Sebastian Anderson equalised for Curlin in the 36 minute. The table in the Bundesliga is like this 30, 63 points for Bayern, Dortmund 57. 48 points for Leverkusen, 45 for Leipzig and Freiburg, 44 for Hoffenheim, 40 for Köln, 38 for Frankfurt, 38 for Union Berlin, 37 for Mainz, 32 for Bochum, 31 for Wolfsburg, 30 for Gladbach, 26 for Stuttgart, Augsburg and Hertha Berlin, and 25 for Bielefeld and Firth with 15 points at the very bottom. Rounding things up, we go to Italy now and to the Serie A. Of course, round 30, it kicked off on Friday with Sassolo defeating Spezia 4-1 in the Mappe Stadium. On Saturday, it was... On, on Friday as well, Genoa defeated Torino 1-0 with 10 men uh, in the stadium in the Regia uh, del Mare. Napoli played Udinese on Saturday and the, it was the top three on the table that played on Saturday, all of them. Uh, plan and not all of them victorious. Napoli defeated Udinese 2 to 1. They came back from behind after Gerard de Lofeo opened the scoring in the 22nd minute. They fought back 2 1 thanks to Victor Osimen who scored the two goals for a Napoli in this game. Now it's take them three points behind, um, you know, Milan at the top of the table, of course. But of course, the big the big side that lost this week and all the big losers, let's say, from the weekend were Inter Milan, who dropped points against Fiorentina. They'd drawn one. All this was a poor game from Inter Milan. They couldn't even p provide some attacking input in the second half. It felt disjointed. It felt 
very, very um, you know, wasteful, I suppose, uh, particularly in the second half for Inter Milan, losing uh, two points against Fiorentina, two points lost, which means that they're now six points ahead of uh, or behind AC Milan on the table with one game in hand, even the game in hand. Doesn't seem like it will help that much unless Milan drops some points in the leading weeks. And it looks like maybe, surprisingly, we'll see either Milan or Napoli win the Serie A this season, which might be a surprise, really, for some. Milan, despite a mostly not that good of a performance against Cagliari as well, um, they they still won, they still got the victory, thanks to Ismail Benassar's goal in the 59th minute. It's an immense uh, opportunity for Milan to take advantage, to go and lead by even bigger margin on top of Serie A, they're now already six points as you mentioned ahead of Inter, three ahead of Napoli, and they will try and take advantage of whatever situation they will have at the moment. It is seven points behind ahead of Juve as well, who could who might enter the chat, who knows, uh, soon uh, enough. Um, it is an important victory for Milan, and it looks like the Serie A title race is still going to be a really exciting one till the end. On Sunday, it was Sampdoria defeated Venezia 2-0, Empoli drawn against Elas Verona 1, all Juventus coming back from their elimination against Villarreal, very ridiculous elimination against Villarreal. They defeat Salernitana 2-0. It was a better performance from Juve. Vlahovic scored, um, you know, and Dybala scored, albeit in the second half. They sat back as they usually do. I mean, against Salernitana, if you're sitting back in the second half, what are you really doing, Allegri? I mean, it's, it's, it's not the best of seasons for Juve in terms of the overall impression of how they play or the overall image of how they play football. In the Roma derby, Roma defeated Lazio 3-0 and it was another incredible victory for Jose Mourinho after qualifying in the Conference League. Tammy Abraham still proving why he is doing so well with Roma uh, this season. This is his um, 20. 26 goal contribution overall uh, with the two goals that he scored. Lorenzo Pellegrini with an unbelievable free kick making it 3-0 and by halftime the game was done and Dustin and Roma only had to defend for the second half against Lazio who couldn't really push the uh, push the limit and couldn't score uh, against them. Of course it was uh, the reverse of the reverse fixture where Lazio defeated Roma 3-2 uh, in, a, in a game where Roma looked I think much worse than the, what they did in this game against Lazio and to finish things off, Atalanta really, um, you know, defeated Bologna 1-0, uh, of course, in a very, very tough uh, game as far as Atalanta is concerned after the qualification in the Europa League. But the situation is now that they are, can't really fight for those top four spots. It seems that they will be, uh, you know, convinced and content with a Europa League spot or potentially even a Conference League spot. They're now six with uh, 51 points behind Roma with 51 points. The table of the Serie A, 66 points for Milan, Napoli 63, 60 for Inter, 59, of course, for Juventus, one game in hand for Inter Milan, 51 for Roma, 51 for Atalanta with a game in hand as well, 49 for Lazio, Fiorentino with a game in hand with 47 points, Tessasolo with 43 uh, points, 42 for Verona, 35 for Torino, 33 uh, for Bologna and Empoli, Udinese with 29, uh, with Spezia 29 as well, 25 for Cagliari, 22 for Genoa, Venezia with 22, and Salernitano with 16 points at the bottom of the table um that's it for this episode thanks for watching slash listening i was with hd of the psp like share comment on the video subscribe to the youtube channel enable notifications to receive all the updates and of course follow us on social media and listen on any podcast listening platform of your choosing on thursday the episode will be uh de dedicated to talking about the playoffs in europe and in africa as well as uh, support us there and wait for us then uh until next time i was the host hd of the psp and I'll see you soon. I ain't close doors, I'm a fool for your love.